It is Wednesday, September 25 of 2024. This is the Endo meeting. And we're going to start off with a discussion of, a, of an experiment that Kamavis has been doing called GEMS. To the mines. All right. Uh, so yes, this is a little progress date on my uh, random walk through the uh, Endo and Agora code base in service of some sort of OCAP kernel. Um, I pressed the, I thought I pressed the screen sharing button. Did I indeed? Can you see my screen? I think so. Your screen is visible. Yes. Screen. The font is incredibly small. Okay. Okay. That's, that's fine. We can arrange. Um, so the main thing that I want to say, uh, give as a status update is that I got something that looks like uh, CrossFat durable references working. Um, with a uh, chip's automatic persistence system. Um, again, the model here is VAT always restarts and then using the chip's VOM kit based automatic persistence system. Um, so this is based on durable zones and KEPTP at the moment. Um, this is, we're using durable zone XOs. I have, uh, I'm experimenting with a, a class registry because of course, every time on restart, you need to provide the implementation of all the classes that you've defined. Um, and so I have a class registry where you just give a string version of the class. Because we know this to just be a class, we could implement some kind of garbage collection around class definitions. Um, the And then that was a little awkward in some use cases. So I also made this thing called an incubation registry, which is just a, like a small program that is also serialized. Wait. And then gets sorry, run. sorry to sorry to interrupt. Are we recording? I believe we are. Because I don't have. Oh wait, no. The sorry, indicator's there. <laughs> yes, we are. Sorry. Thank you for the confirmation. Um, so then I have this incubation registry, which is just this little uh, program. You know, it just stores uh, programs as strings, and they uh, uh, what they get fired at a uh, startup. And they have a, a flag, they have an endowment that says whether or not they're running for the first time. Because sometimes you want to, you know, because we have this automatic persistence, there's some things that you want to do every time at start, like defining your classes. But then there's some things that you only want to do the first time, like some initialization or or like maybe instantiating those classes. If you want it to just be a singleton, you only want to actually instantiate it the first time because it'll be stored persistently using the automatic persistence. Um, so the, um, but, uh, the main update I'm giving here, uh, and again, this was despite, uh, solo parenting two kids and being sick for half of the week, um, that I got the CrossFat durable references working and, uh, that's using this thing called the external reference controller. And it is, uh, kind of a kludgy hack on top of. CAPTP um, in that when we get a new reference imported for the first time, it will um, request. Uh, so the CAPTP IDs are all uh, ephemeral, right, for the for the CAPTP session. And um, the um, the we need some some ID that can per persist past the restart. And so um, we we go and we ask uh, the other side, um, for, for a, a durable ID, which is an ID that's used by the, the bomb kit. Sorry, someone is knocking on the door and I'm the only one home. It's very distracting. Uh, I'll be right back, I guess. They seem very desperate. How do I unshare my screen or something? There we go. Uh, sorry, be right. I think I'll pause the recording. Um, okay, so uh, one thing that um, I mean, we could stop for questions now. There is um, some some things I'd like to ask. Um, the last thing I was explaining was the external reference controller. <clears throat> and by using the CAPTP 
hooks. Um, let me pull it up on the screen. You mean um, the existing captive hook, captive hooks for, um, what? Oh wait, no, I'm thinking about marshalling hooks. What hooks are you talking about? Um, CAPTB has hooks for when a object for the first time crosses the network boundary um, uh, in both directions. There's hooks for each. And so we know when a... Um, when an object has been newly imported, let's see where this happens. So we get these hooks here in the CAPTB options. We actually don't have a GC hook. I was experimenting with that. Um, the, so when we are first, uh, exporting, uh, a reference across CAPTP, um, I have our external reference controller hold that value, uh, because, uh, presumably someone on the other side has access to it and they'll request it. Um, the, and similarly, we have an import hook and we want to register that value as an external reference. Um, and then what's happening in here is it's converting that reference into a custom durable reference uh, so that it is known how to persist it with the uh, vom kit slash durable zone. Um, and the way it does it is terrible, and I would not recommend it as a, a way to do things. But when it first sees this thing, it needs to go back to the other side and say, hey, what is your like durable ID for this thing? Um, and then when it gets it back, it stores that. And then when it needs to reanimate this, this um, stored value, it uh, goes and says, hey, external reference controller on the other side of this connection, give me that thing that you said was called this. I, I I think one of the things that's happening here is that he, is I did I was not unaware that uh, CAPTP provided these hooks, um, um, because in in terms of how the virtual object manager works, as well as the um, the way the kernel handles uh, message messages from say one vat to another, um, there is a lower level. Uh, set of operations uh, for uh, for translating a reference from one um, uh, one context to another. Um, this uh, th there's two two parameters to the marshaller. One is like convert slot to val, and the other is convert val to slot. And they are very parallel to this, but they actually do the work of generating. Um, the the, uh, the 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 identifier and, and assigning it when new one needs to be assigned or recognizing that the thing already exists and and providing it um, and that's the place where we uh, intervene to say oh this is a this is a, a thing that's being uh, stored externally and at that point um, the hooks that are doing this this transformation are are also noticing that this is a new reference or this is an old reference or whatever and managing the reference counting data structures for doing garbage collection and all of that and so i suspect you would want to be and, and what you're getting here is the essentially the after the fact version of that where it has already converted an object reference into an identifier or an identifier into an object reference. And it's just merely telling you uh, that this thing has happened. Um, and um, and so there's a bit of an impedance mismatch there, which is which is maybe one of the reasons why it feels awkward and wrong is because, well, because it is. Um, yeah, yeah CAPTP uh, also has those same hooks. Um, the But there's a lot of, uh, side effects happening in the implementation of those hooks. Yes. So I couldn't just like replace them with my own. Say, hey, here's the slot for this one, and here's the that for that one. Right. So right. <laughs> again, I'm not suggesting this external reference controller as a solution. It was just the quickest thing I could write right. um, to make it work enough for a demo. Um, 
But yes, uh, being able to, as you said, the export hook and the import hook happen after the fact. Um, if I had an opportunity uh, to maybe swap out a value for a different value to represent that one, or uh, or or you know create the value in the first place, how to represent it. Um, if I could set what the slot should be for a value, um, these sorts of things would be uh, really helpful, I think. Um, so what is the work? What is the work of the external reference controller? Is I, I see that you're ignoring the slot argument, which I think is like it would be weird to handle the slot argument since those are ephemeral right. live refs. Um, what? But are they? The so here these slots are the CAPTP slots and not the durable zone slots, um, and so the CAPTP slots are ephemeral. Um, because oh, oh, the sure. CAPTP session state is is ephemeral. That's object or presence plus or minus number, right? That is true for CAPTP. The the durable zone one looks very similar, but has a class slash instance, uh, class number slash instance number format. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So the, this the, so yes. The the thing that's a little weird is that the marshaller marshaling package is used when you're when you're crossing a boundary. Um, CAPTP is a, a, a representation of one particular kind of boundary, which is the boundary uh, that consists of a, of a network connection between two remotely interacting entities, um, um, and what's going on with uh, persistent storage is not crossing um, a network boundary. And so uh, this is this is kind of like, I don't I don't even know what, where to where to put my which foot to foot. It's like the caterpillar trying to wonder which foot to foot do you put for, forward first? In, in any case, well, yeah. I think that we are we are aware that this is a hack <laughs> in order an expedient hack in order to achieve some ends. The the registry is presume uh, because it's ignoring the slot. It's presumably um, interrogating the object itself to figure out what to store durably. Right? That, so that would be nice. It does something even worse, which it goes to the external reference controller on the other side of the connection and sends the value back and says like, "Hey, what is this thing? What mm -hmm. is the ID for this thing?" Um, is, is so it's very silly and there is because we have to synchronously uh, make the thing durable and then we asynchronously get the thing the the identifier persistent identifier for how to make it uh, to, how to reanimate it uh -huh. um, there is okay. a, a time window where you could turn off the computer and and it would break the connection yeah so uh, so the conceit here is that you're using captp to do a thing that live slots does internally and because you're having all of these pairwise CAPTP connections, they can't um, they can't discuss amongst themselves um, uh, about this registry. They have to communicate over the wire between their their own registries. Okay, uh, that that ground it, I think. Yeah. Take, so to another uh, constraint that, that my approach has had here, not with not with the not the, simply the approach with the external reference controller, but the fact that you can make um, uh, these ex, these external references, these CAPTP references uh, durable, is that you can only transmit copy data or durable data over a CAPTP. Over and, this over this kind of CAPTP uh, over a CAPTP connection so formed, right? Yes. And, and this is intentional um, because they, they, I think, I find this limitation good because then anything you get over the wire, you can put in, you can store it, and expect to get it back. Yeah. So the, you're you're using, so if if you 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 could use this locally, in other words, in order to create. A membrane around a particular around a different durable scope, effectively. That if you want, yeah. So I, I use this across two vats locally. Uh huh. All right, I get the idea. I think. Um. Uh. 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 
so anyways that's the external reference controller and i was uh happy to be able to get uh these durable references cross vat durable references uh you know being able to store get stored using the automatic persistence and uh let's see do we have a test that is intuitive um this is not what i asked for um here we have a a friends list that you can add friends to the list and then in this other vat we are making a friend which is just sort of like a dummy empty object and we can have the friend list uh just add a friend so it looks like this this is the this is from the perspective of this you don't even know that that friend lives in a, another vat and you can just use it this way using the chips automatic persistence system and the external ref sets up the durability um, for the, the durable nature of this remote reference. And so this this line 101 is what what is achieved here uh, by this experiment. Um, and then you can turn, uh, there is a weird side effect of the way I'm doing things so that when you pull this thing out of the storage, it is not the presence. It is a promise for the presence, even though what you put in might have been a presence. That part is awkward and confusing, um, but it's enough to make the system work. Right, and eventual send is supposed to paper over that distinction. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, you can't really do much with the, the presence itself other than a, a quality checks and then this would mess up your equality checks. But if if we had more, uh, you know, if we didn't use the external reference controller and had more control for what the thing looks like on the other side, we could maybe ma do some proxy presence or something. So the presence is immediately available and it's just the presence forwards to something that's not yet available. ZB says optionally, eventually a quality check. Uh, that, 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 <laughs> that there's that promise dot join is effectively supposed to be that. Um, though we 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 need an eventual join, eventual join. The, the the semantics of eventual join are you take two eventual references and if they settle to the same presence, um, to identical presences, then you give you give the presence it, it fulfills to the presence and otherwise it rejects um so yeah uh, did promise.join make it to javascript promise i don't recall no no did not nope even worse i think there's been uh implementations that you did something else under this name i hope that was not. So I, uh, I have a couple of questions um, so that I can continue this research if that's all right. Um, one is uh, I noticed that exo constructors themselves are not durable. Um, you know, you get, you say like uh, exo class, whatever you give it the implementation, you get back a, a make XYZ function and you can't store. They're um, not passable, yeah. They are what, not remotable. Um, yeah. which is a sub requirement of durable. Uh, durable means it needs to be um, passable and uh, in any case, remotable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so the way I'm viewing durability is that the the durability system needs to know how to endure the thing, but it also require. And so I have, I'm manually telling the thing how to uh, endure some values. Um, but it uh, um, it also requires that it be remotable, which is um, an interesting requirement. And, and I actually disabled it for uh, this demo. And it still works because it knows how to endure it. Yeah, it, this actually brings up a point that I've been struggling with a little bit in the swing sets uh, design where... Um, Every durable thing is uh, exportable. So I think this is, I, I view remotable in this case as being able to 
um, to generate a ref uh, for the thing, being able to talk about it in the distributed system or in the virtualized system. Um, and there is definitely some entanglement there that that's assuming that um, anything that's that couples um, remotability that couples both the distributed aspect with the virtual virtual aspect. Um, I one way I, I thought we could fix this is by uh, making sure something that is. Uh, durable is not automatically exportable, then it cannot be uh, actually sent uh, across uh, across because there are some things sometimes you want to just keep for yourself durably, but you might not want to, uh, to expose them to the world. Um, it sounds here what you want is actually the, the opposite. It's you want to store something, uh, you want to store the maker itself. And yeah, this is uh, or, or some sort well. of class reference. There doesn't seem to be a durable class reference. Obviously, the instance has some internal pointer to the class that it comes from, but yeah. they uh, and you can store an instance, but you can't store the class reference as far as I can tell. Yeah, Maybe and, and there's there's another limitation there that we've talked about, which is a zone, uh, which is basically an abstraction on top of uh, of baggage and and the, and the map effectively a map store um, yeah this is this is all built using durable zones so yeah I'm... and so the zone is not itself uh uh storable <laughs> uh which is a bit annoying hmm. uh even though the underlying baggage is um so yeah there's there's a lot of it, it grew it grew organically and so there's there's a few uh iffy corners there i would say okay. um and I, I, so to get back to your maker, uh, that's not durable. That's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting point. However, it might be tricky to address. Um, there is often a pattern, which is you have a, uh, exo class kit, uh, where you want, you get a maker that gives you the kit, but really, uh, you don't you usually want to attenuate your maker to uh, keep the internal facets uh, to yourself and only uh, and only like return a public facet when you uh, when you actually call the maker. And oftentimes, what you need is to have the maker. Um, you need to have that maker. It's probably that maker that you want to store, not the internal maker that returns the uh, the cohort. Um, so, yeah, I. It's it's a good point. How do we how do we facilitate that that pattern? Uh, we actually have a similar thing with uh, async flow, where oftentimes we're gonna want to pass uh, makers across uh, the async flow membrane. Probably should talk about async flow someday. Um, and uh, and the way we're fixing that effectively is recognizing functions and automatically wrapping wrapping them into a exo singleton. That closes over the maker. Um, so, yeah, it's not great, but it's it's just a little bit of hoops that you have to jump through. Okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah, we we covered briefly the the remotable requirement for durability. Um, did. Um, Did we? I don't understand why that requirement is there. Um, could someone? I, I, I think it's again, remotable. The passable remotable was it, the distributed system was there before the virtual system existed, mm. and so when you needed a way to create a uh, a reference that you could serialize. For your objects in, in in virtual system, uh, I think it was logical to just use uh, the uh, the abstraction that that was there for remotability. I don't know if if that was in hindsight correct. Mm, I I I suspect that you don't want to have separate categories 
for durable and remotable, and it really is possibly just a failing of the name to capture the breadth of its expressivity. It's just remotable means that this is an object that has been marked right. as an object that has methods. That's it. Yeah. 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 You're right. So remotable is probably a misnomer here. It's just saying it's an object that satisfies some constraints. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we can do two things on top of that. Well, specifically, it's what 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 a remote what remotable means is that it's the dual of eventual send. It's an eventual receiver, um, and it 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 means that essentially it can be referred to from elsewhere, and elsewhere might be the other end of a network connection, or it might be. Um, some stuff stored on disk somewhere. Or it might be some other thing that we haven't thought of yet. I think uh, I think it, maybe the constraint I was running up against might have been some weirder case where I said I was going it was going to be an object, but then I actually was returning a promise. And then it, it was like this this promise is not uh ah. so uh, promise is not being things. Promise is not being durable is something else. Ah, no, but this was the promise not being remotable, but I think it was after it had already filtered by type dead down to the object. And then the a promise is not a remotable object. Remotable as a promise. But anyways, uh, I, I'll i reinvestigate the, the constraint I, I ran into there. Um, uh, I guess, yes. Yeah, so so I found that I needed to do, you know, re-register classes every, every time I started. Oh, one moment. I noticed that you spelled remotable with an E. I think that we had agreed, <laughs> all agreed that we are spelling it remodable. Okay. These are remodable objects to hereafter be called remodables when spoken aloud so that these confusions <laughs> never occur again. <laughs> Richard, sure. you know. I, I always call them remo tables, but <laughs> yours, yours works too. <laughs> 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 Richard, when we talked about this, you specifically said that remodable was a plausible pronunciation in local dialect. <laughs> yes, yes, and I stand by that. <laughs> um, yes, so maybe it's a, a silly question, but I, I, is there anything in the endo or agoric stack that is uh, dealing with class definitions? I mean, maybe you're always just storing a script and running it every time. I don't know what the convention is for VAT upgrade um, development. The, that restart. <clears throat> that, yeah, when, when you're started VAT, you're, uh, you have to redefine all your kinds. So all your uh, exo, uh, you have to redefine all your exo in the first crank that starts your VAT in the build root object. Uh, so you have a one shot without interaction with the outside world uh, to redefine everything uh, that your previous uh, incarnation created, defined. Sorry. Yeah, just um, to, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so is it? So if I'm not mistaken, that means that if you restart a that, uh, and in and fail before quiescing the first crank mm -hmm. to define every kind that was previously created, mm -hmm. then that will fail. Correct. Yeah. And you you uh, don't get to see any further messages if you fail to define any of your previous kinds. That makes sense to me. I think I was also interested in uh, just giving a function for how to redefine those classes and let them be redefined lazily. Um, but it doesn't look like the system's built that way now. No, because what if that fails? What if, you know, um, I mean, calling the definition with the behaviors is the same as providing a function that will give the behavior later, isn't it? That is a good question. I guess I don't know how JavaScript works under inside of an engine. I is your 
is your concern here the amount of execution you do uh preemptively? Yes, because I am doing like compartment evaluations uh for this class registry. You give it a serial a string that represents the class definition and uh, and it evals them on startup. Right. If you I do mean, that, that means. Yeah. Um so there is potentially here yeah i mean it's it's it feels like feels like a potential optimization there okay. possibly yeah it, it doesn't exist it could exist that's fine for me the 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 the, the, the problem essentially comes down to the fact that, that javascript has no no way to well basically the the, the pro fundamental problem that the the data persistence mechanism has to solve is how to reunite data with the code that uses that data uh, at a later time and uh and there's fundamentally no way to uh to serialize code aside from having an evaluable string representation of the source and, um, and which which kind of operates at another layer of abstraction above I have I have code which is you know live running code in memory and I have data which is live bits in memory and I want to associate them together um, and you know in the fullness of time I think there's a hope to be able to um, to deal with you know mobile code and 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 the like, but the 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 underlying problem is that running code as opposed to source um, can embody um, uh, references to to data which is not explicitly explicitly identified anywhere which is basically stuff that's for example the, the, the classic one being stuff that's captured in the lexical environment um then the, the the thing is that the stuff that's captured in the lexical environment can be captured in the lexical environment of, of multiple uh multiple functions for example that are all in the same scope um and so if you want to just serialize a function you have this question of well, how much of its enclosing scope is important to capture as part of that? And that's just a big old hairy mess that we don't understand very well, and that none of the existing JavaScript engines give you a handle on managing. And so the expedient is to say, we're not going to deal with that right now because we don't have to. Yep. Um, okay, I think I have already consumed too much time and I got to show off the line 101, which is what I'm proud of. <clears throat> nice. Um, I think this brings up some questions about um, the coupling between durability and live references. Um, I don't know. I I'm not familiar enough with live slots to say, but I know that Michael Figs had intimated to me that uh, that it might have been possible to frame live slots in a way such that the durability layer was and that in fact Chip had implemented a decoupling of durability and and live reference management. Is that right, Chip? Uh, for the purposes of tests and only tests. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I find that interesting. Yeah, there. Uh, I actually just did some uh, work uh, around that recently uh, to improve that test environment. But the test environment effectively implements uh, all the durability, uh, virtual, virtual and durable uh, object system without any of the um, any of the uh, distributed communication system minus some slight interactions with what we have for watch promise and basically so yeah watch promise is the funky bits there uh if you can forgive a little bit of a, a performative 
joke for the benefit of the recording. Let's take a moment to talk about money and politics. All right, we're back from talking about money and politics. Chortle, chortle, chortle. Um, the so let let's talk a bit about durability, eh? Um, and uh, figuring we ought to factor that we ought to to t take live slots and factor it such that the 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 durability layer is se is separated somehow somewhere um the one of the things that is interesting mm -hmm. to me in general about the the difference between oh okay, so one way of looking at how we move forward with the pet demon with live slots is that live slots would simply replace CAPTP and SUTU. Um, so, I mean, as it is, CAPTP is a fork of live slots. It's just a fork of live slots that predates a whole bunch of bug fixes and GC and uh, durability and virtual objects entirely. It predates all of that. And it would be interesting to have a live slots that layers those concerns instead of conflating them. But at the end of the day, <laughs> Um, this would be replacing that, that one way to move forward is to simply replace cap TP and the pet demon with this mechanism. I'm curious. So currently, currently the, uh, the pet demon runs in one vat and all of the workers run in peer vats. You can look at it that way. Um, it happens that the, the, the process tree doesn't look like that today, but it could. Um, and all of the connection at the moment, the only connections that are expressible are between the demon are one to one are point to point connections between the demon and any of the vats. So any message that is going from vat to vat passes through the demon to get there um, just by dint of. Um, that you can re resolve an object from one one CAPTP session to be the handler for an object from another CAPTP session. And it's largely transparent. It looks like you're talking directly to each other, but there's no three-party handoff. There's no clustering. There's, in, a, in, in short, live slots gives us an opportunity to allow each of the VATs to communicate with each other directly in the cases where well, that's, that's interesting because the, 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 what you, the topology you describe is very much like how swing set, swing set kernel relates to its vats. Um, the, the, the virtue of relaying through that central point is that you have to manage um, two n connections rather than n squared connections, and, and that's a significant advantage. Yeah. So the so the yeah the network topology the local network topology could remain largely the same. Um, yeah, in which case live slots would be in a, in a, in a process of its own and the demon would be a, the demon and all of the workers would be sub processes of the live slot supervisor process by whatever name it is. And, and we would have largely the same kind of communication. It's just that they wouldn't terminate and that the connections wouldn't terminate in the demon vat. They would t terminate in the parent of all vats. Um, I'm curious what that means. I'm curious what that means for collectability of references when a, when a vat, when a, when a connection closes effectively, when a vat dies, um, with cap TP, any objects that were in that vat are immediately revoked and all messages fail going forward. I admit, perhaps it's the same. Perhaps live sots gives you exactly the same affordance. Like the GC implications are the same. I, I think I think it does. Okay. All right. Um so then that brings up another interesting issue that with the pet demon, the like if we had not, if we did not have uh, durability, but, uh, so, well, okay. So, so with the with dur, if we did have a, a layering of durability in this system, um, 
what is the scope what is the scope of durability is it is it coupled to the vat or is it something that exists that there can be multiple zones within a vat don't understand the question yeah oh, i don't understand i i i'm revealing my ignorance of how durability works um is you there... can have Here. multiple disjoint graphs within a, a vat but it does the machinery does operate through globals uh, but you can have different durable stores and and attain and achieve disjoint object graphs right so if you had multiple caplets running in the same vat which is a possibility that is currently possible with the pet demon they could have each of those caplets could have its own baggage hierarchy is does the serialization um actually allow for the the dis does the serialization as written now uh allow for the disjoint sets cuz you you like you know you for example in the fake vom kit that i'm using and that's basically the only thing i'm familiar with you can serialize the fake store um you can you know stringify the fake store um and but if you're working with two disjoint sets i don't know so so right now this is actually uh touches on one of the things i was working on between uh, between agoric and uh, metamask uh for reasons having strictly to do with um, very pragmatic considerations of, of uh, managing the database, all of the actual storage that the VATs have in SwingSet is managed on their behalf by the kernel in a single database. But in principle, there's no reason why each VAT couldn't have its own storage. And in fact, the way it works, the, the storage that belongs to one VAT is completely partitioned from the storage that's used uh, by another VAT. I mean, they're all in the same um, table, but there's a key, a, you know, component of the key that basically segregates one VAT's, VAT store from another VAT, VAT store. And you could just as easily, in principle, give each one its own completely independent store. Um, um, there's no coupling between what's persistent in one vat and what's persistent in the other vat. And that's how it is now. Um, right. So, so, so it I, is just an exercise for, so it is an exercise that we can leave to future yeah. arts of partitioning, sub-partitioning within a vat, Ethan. Yes. And one of the things I've wanted to be able to do is to enable um, greater freedom for VATs to execute concurrently. Um, um, if you're not concerned about maintaining deterministic ordering, which Agoric very much is concerned with, um, um, it's it's actually quite a bit easier. Okay. So one another... Another thing that is different about the demon is currently that the that you do not get storage of any kind. It, it's uh, it's how to inject baggage into a caplet is is maybe the same, but looks a little different in the pet demon. At the payment, the pet demon is in a very nascent stage right now. There isn't a general notion of storage. There's just you get your caplet gets a power box, right? Um, and that power box is an arbitrary reference, but by convention, it's an object that gives you the ability to, among other things, store stuff um in a table that's just for you. Um and Actually, you're given the root of your of your persistent yes yes yeah, exactly. stuff yeah so i so i so i guess so an interesting an interesting thing about the the demon is that 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 object the power box that a caplet gets could be shared between caplets like multiple caplets could share it but it would be silly and dangerous to do so um since they have the potential to stomp on the same key space and at the moment that's the only idea i have for upgrade 
is that you could say just discontinue this caplet and then create a new caplet that has the same power box baggage if you that's will essentially that's essentially how upgrade works now yeah okay so uh, mm -hmm. all right looks like we're heading in the same direction yeah. uh, the the so it's a possibility that we could frame durability over live uh, that we could frame durability as a as uh uh, well, one of the things you could do is you could have a sort of um, uh, a, I don't want to use the word like meta state or something, but basically you have a, 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 a tree of storage, which belongs to the, um, whatever code happens to be running in, in, in the VAT. Um, but there's other stuff which characterizes that VAT, including um, you know, some initialization parameters, maybe what code it's actually running, and various other attributes, including some metadata like name and you know, mm -hmm. maybe some time timestamp, whatever. I mean, it, there there are there are things which are outside of the scope of the the um, the specific code that gives the, the thing its personality that's part of sort of the gen generic runtime that goes with it. And you could imagine having that block of stuff all be stored together such that you have an operation which is, you know, you open up this, this container of, of, of persistent storage and it tells you what are all the pieces that you have to set up um, um, to start running. Um, and then when you start running, one of the things you do is you hand it the one piece, which is the, the piece that it's supposed to get. Um, and it's just almost almost like a, a, you know just the way an executable image file works in a you know any operating system. Hmm. So currently, caplets receive two arguments, one of which is an arbitrary reference that conventionally is your power box, and then the second argument is sort of incarnation specific an, an incarnation specific bag of stuff that might be where baggage goes yeah um, the or it might go in the other it might go it might go in your power box i don't know we could that's something for us to figure out i suppose the um currently the only thing that's in your incarnation specific bag of stuff is your cancellation token so you can observe when you've been killed and clean up Okay, we're a little bit over time. Good talk, folks. I think that we're getting closer to knowing what we're doing. I think, yeah. I think Phil Salen's principle still applies. The problem with being confused is that, well, first of all, you're confused. I feel less confused. I feel less confused, but I'm still pretty confused. All right. All right, more later. Aaron, you're still feeling, feeling confused, but less confused. You you are inaudible. So you're confused and inaudible. Yeah, layers of confusion. <laughs> um, I, I think w one thing that keeps coming up as being useful for me would be uh, some sort of CAPTP compatible uh, presence where I can like, lately late set its its destination like where it actually should deliver the messages to um like for example you can't do a far on a proxy because a proxy is not well it needs to be hardened or appear to be hardened right um so i couldn't um i can't re receive arbitrary uh method calls and i can't um you know forward them on to somewhere else What's yeah, I, I I frequently have have use of a uh, a thing which is effectively the serialized message shorn of its target destination. So you need um, to look at handled promise. Hmm? You need to look at handled promise, Aaron. Yes, well, handled promise yeah. does that, but I mean, it's 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 very often the case that you're assembling the message before you know where it's going to go. Um, 
and oh. also also the case where you want to want to send the same message to say a distribution group to multiple destinations um but you only want to assemble the message once and there were also some discussions i think about um well with where was it again we were talking about a next so potentially that we'd be able to have to end all uh, any methods, right? What was it? Or was that a, uh, something that came up in the OCAP and uh, context? Thing, yes, the thing that hap that comes up in OCAP and, uh, is that the, the, the protocol is only going to have a send and or deliver verb, and it's not going to care particularly whether the target is implemented as a function or an object, and that is just going to be convention um, and on the JavaScript side, what that means is that you could choose to implement an exo either as a function or as an object with methods, and that the calling convent in the case where you implement the exo as we traditionally do as a fixed list of, uh, and we could have method missing on this case too, but the idea is that we implement exo as a bank of stringly named methods, and those are going to be in OCAP, and those are going to be expressed as application of a function where there is an OCAP and selector as the first argument, which corresponds to the string name of the function in JavaScript, followed by variadic arguments, which get just get passed along. The um, And the trick is that on the JavaScript layer, we would be able to, say, have a make exo function, hypothetically, that would be able to receive arbitrary function calls or delivery receive uh, arbitrary deliveries from the other eventual send side, in which case the selector would be visible as the first argument. If there's a selector, because you can also call a function without a selector and it's just a function. Um, yeah, which is to say that it would be in that in that model, it would be trivial to receive method missing by implementing an exo as an exo function. We're I don't we're not in that world yet, but that's where we're headed. Um and it follows from that that make exo could have a method missing in its options bag if we wanted. I'm not sure why we don't if yet if i'm not sure whether there is a reason why we don't yet but we wh yeah. while while reframing live slots which is to say rewriting a cap tp we should fix that what is the thing that's missing you said a uh, method missing hook like this your, your xo has received a method invocation for a method not implemented in its class uh because i know the um the um, remote invocation pathway has this this idea that if the if the the method selector is is null, it's a function invocation, um, and it has to deal with the fact that there's that a method is missing because if you just send a message over the wire to somebody, it might actually be missing at the other end, and so it it actually does have code to deal with that case. It may just be a matter of exposing it in in whatever the API is so that you can explicitly make use of it as a as a consumer of messages. Right. Right. Okay. And with that, good meeting group. See you next time. Abyssinia.